Cyrus, do you need to give up your American citizenship? Cyrus, will your apartment in Shanghai have electricity? Cyrus, how far is the drive from Orlando, Florida to Shanghai, China? Now, these three questions were asked to me in December 2006. Let me set the setting for you. So I was in my home, in my parents' home in Orlando, Florida. And my parents had organized a party of close friends and family. And we're sitting there, and I'm about two weeks removed from, from heading to Shanghai, China to begin my career. I had just graduated university, and these were the three most common questions that people had asked me. Again, the first question, do you need to give up your American citizenship? You see, many people in America just were unfamiliar with the concept that I would go to China and that I would actually be an expat. Of course I don't have to give up my American citizenship. I can go and get a work permit in China. Maybe it was because of the fact that China is a communist country, they thought I had to relinquish my American passport. When somebody asked me, Cyrus, will your apartment in Shanghai have electricity? Well, the only thing I could do was show them a picture of Pudong. This is in Shanghai, circa October 2006. And I said, well, look at these beautiful buildings there. Surely, if they can build skyscrapers like this, they're going to be filled with electricity. And the last question, can you drive from Florida to China? Well, I don't need to bring up a graph here to show you that. Obviously, we all know there's a Pacific Ocean in the middle. It's impossible to drive from Florida to China. But again, the reason why I, bring, I open this presentation up today is to show you 14 years ago, not many people really understood China. And I think it's very important that today, that many more people understand China because moving forward, China is always going to play a pivotal role in our society and in our world. Now, I believe that many people around the world fear China, but the basis for that fear is a lack of understanding. So it is the goal today, you know, to hopefully be able to allow more people to really understand, to fill that gap, allow more people to understand this country of China. Now, let me introduce myself and give you a little bit of history about what, what I've done and who I am. My name is Cyrus Jansen. I'm an American expat. I've been living around the world for the past 14 years. I was very fortunate to spend 10 years in greater China, first in the Chinese city of Shanghai and then Hong Kong. It was an amazing time. And again, I, I went to China directly after I graduated university. Here's a picture of me, circa January 2007. You can still see that I'm representing my university, Florida State University, very proudly. Just a couple weeks into my China adventure, I was down in Hong Kong to get my official work permit to work in China. Again, I didn't have to relinquish my American passport, as some of my friends thought I would have to. Now, I excelled at a sport called golf, and this is what I did. I went to China to become a golf professional. And I spent the first seven years teaching golf to thousands upon thousands of Chinese. It was an amazing experience for me because I was able to travel around the country. I was traveling around doing amazing corporate clinics for some very big clients like Mercedes-Benz, ICBC, Dow Chemical. We were tra I went, traveled to over 50 cities, teaching thousands of people how to grow the game. And it was an amazing time for me to be in China because it was really the birth and really the, the start of a golf revolution in China. So, and as an American golf professional, I was there contributing to China. But it was also a great time to be in China because in 2007, that's when China was really starting to turn things up. Their economy was really starting to rev up. The country was developing. Of course, in 2008, the country hosted the a beautiful Summer Olympics in Beijing and had a phenomenal time learning about the culture, the language, the people, and spending so much time in that country. I went on to then move to Hong Kong after seven years. I had an opportunity to go and be the general manager of a sports marketing company. And again, we started working with international clients, doing events all over mainland China. In total, I spent 10 years in China, and it was one of the best times of my life. An amazing experience. And what I've realized is, is that along the way, there's been a lot of misconceptions about China. Many people do not understand China. And I stumbled upon this quote, and I want to share it with you. When it comes to China, there are two types of foreigners. Those that dislike China and those that have been to China. Now, I'll say that this quote, I believe, is it's not 100% accurate. But I do believe there is some truth into this. Okay? Some of the people that dislike China the most, that really even hate China, 
have never spent much time in the country at all. They've done very little to actually research about China or get, try to get to know it. And unfortunately, our world in the Western media is filled with so many misconceptions and stereotypes and just flat out biased reporting. Now, there was a point where I've become so frustrated with this that I wanted to actually make my voice be heard. And it was about a year ago that I decided to make a video and I put it on YouTube. This was my first YouTube video, LeBron James in China. About a year ago, LeBron James got in a lot of heat because he said this. He said, as an American, we have the freedom of speech, but we have to realize that freedom of speech potentially can have consequences. Now, many people saw that as LeBron James selling out to China. But the reality is, is like I said earlier in the slide, is that when you travel around the world, it's important to open your mind and learn about other cultures. We're always taught to, as children, to never judge a book by its cover, okay? It's really important that you start learning about these other cultures. In this video, I make reference to, for instance, if you wanted to travel to India and you wanna say, hey, I've got this brilliant idea on how to starve starvation in India, why don't you start eating beef? You have the freedom of speech to say that, but culturally, that's not going to translate because in the Hindu culture, the cow is a sacred animal. It's just having these very basic cultural understandings that is very important today. Now, I went on to continue making more YouTube videos, and the YouTube channel has continued to grow. I've been amazed, by the, amazed and humbled by the support from people around the world on people really wanting to understand more about China. And this has become a passion for me because my wife is Chinese. We have three beautiful mixed-race children. I am forever going to be connected to China, and I want more people to really know the truth about this amazing country. Now, when we start talking specifically about China, there's actually a three-step process on how many Western governments and how many Westerners in general are viewing China. And let me, let me explain that to you. The first step is that China is communist. Okay, this is something that all of us know. But the word communist or communism is a word that is feared very much in Western society. Now, again, I'm from America, and when you say communism, many people automatically think that it is one of the worst things in the world. For instance, when they think of communism, they think totalitarian dictator, okay? They think of a people that are completely repressed, have absolutely no human rights, no personal freedom, completely cut off from the outside world. This is what people are thinking of when they hear the word communism. But the country that I've just described is not China. Maybe you're thinking of North Korea. And unfortunately, this is what happens for China, is that they often get lumped in with the same boat as, as North Korea. Now, North Korea is exactly what I've just described. There's not personal freedoms. You don't see North Korean expats. You don't see North Korean tourists. North Koreans cannot leave their country. They are cut off from the outside world. There is one person that is dominating everything that happens in that country. That's North Korea. Yes, that's a form of communism, but that doesn't mean every single communist country is like that. But that's a hard concept for people to understand. So the second point is that many people assume that communist is evil. And again, this is one of the things as an American that, we are, that I grow up hearing. As an American, I'm a product of the American school system. Again, we are always taught that democracy is king. Democracy is the most important value, and it's something that everybody in this world should have. But the reality is, is when you've traveled around the world, as I've been very fortunate to do, you start to realize that the world is too unique and too diverse for only one type of government to exist. It doesn't make sense that only democracy is the only way forward. It simply can't be. But unfortunately, we know this three-step process. Look at this three-step process. The first is China is communist. Number two is communist is evil. So it's very simple what point number three is, and that is, of course, that China is evil. And then unfortunately, this is what many people believe. And again, this is what Western media says. This is what Western media says is that China is the greatest threat in the world right now. China is trying to take over America. China, China, China. China is always in our spotlight. And unfortunately, so many people are quick to judge China without ever really understanding anything about it. Now, I want to give a little bit of insights into the Chinese government and how it works. And this is a very famous quote that, that really portrays the difference between my American government and China. In America, you can change the party, but it's very difficult to change the policy. 
In contrast, in China, you cannot change the party. It is a one-party state, but it's much easier to change the policy. Okay? Now, we know that this is true in America. For instance, we just got through the 2020 election. It was a monumental event for America, also for the world. You know, the presidential election in America is a worldwide event because America's role in the world, I mean, it impacts everybody. This is why everybody around the world, globe is tuning in to see the election results. And we just decided to change parties. For the last four years, we had Donald Trump and the Republican Party. We have now switched to the Democrat Party and Joe Biden. But it's interesting enough, like I said, it's very difficult to change that policy. In 2008, Barack Obama, the Democratic president, came out with Obamacare, or the Affordable Health Care Act, Affordable Care Act. And it's been a long process to get this Affordable Air Act going. As soon as Donald Trump comes in, he wants to get rid of it. Now Joe Biden's coming in, he wants to bring it back. You know, we've been dealing with this Affordable Health Care Act for over a decade now. And it's very difficult to get these passed because, again, you have these two parties that are constantly battling each other. And it's very difficult. And the reason for that is, again, I'm here in Canada, the beautiful Kamloops. And it's amazing because here in Canada, we have socialized medicine. Okay? It's, not, it's not a privilege. It's a right. But you talk about socialized medicine in America? Oh, no, that's communism. That's socialism. Let's go back to that three-step process. That is evil. <laughs> no socialism allowed. Even though when you look at most developed Western countries, you know, a lot of them have socialized medicine. It's not, it shouldn't be a privilege. It should be a right. Now, in China, again, you can't change the party. It is impossible. It is a one-party state. That is not going to change. The interesting thing, though, is that China's one-party state changes policies all the time. And they're very quick to adapt into certain situations. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of what I've experienced in my years in China. I'm going to take you back to January 2007. This is a picture of me with my colleagues. This is my second night in China. I'm there in the back wearing the red sweater. And you can see we're having one of a, a delicious meal. This is a hot pot meal, one of the best meals experiences that you can have in China. You can see the empty glasses of beer on the table, the whiskey bottles. We had an amazing night. Okay? It was my, I, I was the last... Um, team member to arrive. I just arrived from, from America. We had a big celebration. The team was finally together. And you can see the gentleman there in the front left, the Chinese man, he was our general manager. Now that evening, all of us had a lot to drink. I would say seven, eight, nine beers, whatever it was. We had a great celebration. And at the end of the night, the Chinese general manager said, Cyrus, welcome to the team. Jump in my car, I'll drive you home. And of course, for me, I said, well, what do you mean? We've just had eight, nine beers. You can't, can't possibly drive me home. And I quickly realized that that was the culture. In 2007, 2008, drunk driving was an epidemic in China. Everybody did it. Everybody went to the park, went to your dinner, you got drank a lot, and you simply drove home. That was the culture. Now, of course, this led to extremely high you know, fatal accidents. There was a tremendous number of accidents in China. And the problem was, as well, is that the system was corrupt. If you got caught by a police officer, well, it was very easy. You could just pay him off. No fine. No problem at all. But China had a really difficult situation because this event was happening. Expo 2010. The World Expo was coming to Shanghai. And notice that tagline on there, better city, better life. How could the Chinese government be promoting a better city and a better life when citizens are being killed every single night because people are drinking and driving all over the place. This really was a huge problem in China. And China's one-party state realized that. And overnight, they changed the law. Yeah, there's no long, complicated process on, on, you know, let's pass this law, pass this law. What does this party think? No, we're changing the law starting tomorrow. What happened was, is overnight, they changed the law to say that if you're caught drunk driving, you're immediately arrested in the car, two weeks in jail. If you're caught a second time, six months in jail, you lose your license for life. You want to know what happened to drunk driving in China? Almost down to nothing. Almost overnight. It was a systematic change. What was amazing was, is at that time, we would routinely be going out with clients for dinner and drinking a ton. Literally, the next day, we would go out and all of us are drinking tea now because we knew the law. You're not allowed to drink and drive anymore. It's as simple as that. We saw a similar law passed with smoking in Beijing when they passed that a few years ago, saying that you're not allowed to smoke now 
in public restaurants and public spaces. Again, bringing up the China to the international standards. The drunk driving laws, now inter same as international standard. Smoking laws, the same. When I got my driver's license in Shanghai, back in 2007, you could literally go inside and you could pay somebody a couple hundred renminbi to sit down and take the test for you. It was blatant corruption. It was absolutely easy. You could just pay somebody and you could essentially get a driver's license. But when I had to renew it a few years later, everything changed. Now I had to actually pass a 100-point test. I had to get 90% in order to pass that. I had to study for months in order to renew my license because they said, no, we need to come up to the international standards. And this is how China has been progressing and has been changing. Now, there's never been a greater example for this than we saw earlier this year when the coronavirus came to Wuhan. And China's government reacted and they said, we need to tackle this problem head on. They did something unprecedented in human history. They locked down Wuhan, a city, the population three times that of Los Angeles and a city five times the size of London. They locked it down for 76 days. They locked down the entire country. What China did is they, in the span of 10 days, they built these hospitals, 10 days. Now, the amazing thing about that this time is, is that in America, during the same time that China was building these two hospitals, Donald Trump was standing impeachment, okay? It took the United States government 20 days to have an impeachment trial on Donald Trump. Now, the interesting thing was is that we knew that Donald Trump would be acquitted because the Republicans controlled the Senate. So there was no way that even if they said, okay, he's guilty, we're gonna impeach him, you knew that he was going to get acquitted. So there was actually really no point in having this impeachment trial. It was just show. So in 20 days, America has a trial that results in nothing. In half that time, China takes 10 days to build this hospital. They relocate doctors from every single province in China, all centralized back to Wuhan. They send every single resource they can to that city to tackle it head on. And I don't know if everybody knows this, but basically China has been pretty much controlled COVID for the past few months. Life in China is almost back to normal. Wuhan is exactly like it was before. It's incredible. But again, it's a concentrated move. No, one in, no government in the world can move as fast and efficiently as China's government. And it is, again, that one-party state. Now, I often say that probably one of China's greatest political advantages over the United States is that they're not subject to every four years of political turmoil. You saw what happened. Again, I'm American. I'm a proud American. But you see what has happened in our country over this past 12 months when it's Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, the amount of division, the chaos that has ensued. Even after this election result, well, technically we still don't even know if we have a result yet. Joe Biden is president-elect. Donald Trump refuses to concede. There's still so much confusion going on. This is really showing how divided our nation is. And I believe this is a real problem in America because with a nation so divided, how can our nation move forward? Now, for the rest of, so, what I'm going to transition to in this speech now is I want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about some of the most common myths that I often hear about China. I want to talk about these myths because I want people to have a better understanding of China. I want to try to relinquish some of these fears that people have about China. Because if I, fear, I feel that if you can understand China more, you're not going to be scared of it. And then to close this off, we're going to talk about why China is such an important market. Now let's begin with myth number one. There is no freedom in China. Now many people tell me this. They say, Cyrus, I know that you like China, but the reality is, is that the Chinese people have no freedom. There's no human rights in China. There's no freedom of speech. I mean, I can't even access Western social media sites like this. How are the Chinese people gonna live? Now the interesting thing is, is we look at, yes, Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, all of these things are blocked in China. There is the Great Firewall in China. China's government does censor content. 100% true. I'm not going to argue that. But the interesting thing is, is that freedom means different things to different people. For example, Americans often tell me, Cyrus, you know what's great about America? We can go on the streets, and I can simply say, I don't like the president. I think he's an idiot. I can say whatever I want. I have that freedom of speech. In America, we do it pretty good. Right, this is Saturday Night Live. Right? We get great actors like Alec Baldwin playing Trump. Shout out to Jim Carrey, the Canadian, playing a great Joe Biden. It's funny in America that we value so much that we can make fun of our leaders. 
But it's interesting, from a cultural perspective in China, Chinese people will say, well, it's not really something that we want to do. We're, I think it's actually better for us that we have a leader that we can entrust in, that we trust in, and that we can respect. The ability to make fun of our leader is not something that we're really craving. Yes, you have the freedom of speech, but we don't really care to have that particular freedom of speech. Now, it was interesting. A lot of people like to you know, argue me on points on YouTube or you know, they know that I'm, I'm a content creator. I make these videos to help people understand China. Somebody said something to me really interesting. They said, Cyrus, it's amazing that you make these content videos on YouTube. Okay? It's amazing that you talk about China on YouTube. But the reality is, is that Chinese people are cut off from the outside world. You have 1.4 billion people cut off. They have no idea what's going on outside of China. Because if they did, if they got a taste of Western democracy and how we live in the West, whew, they'd be leaving China in a heartbeat. And I think it's quite interesting. I think we should look at some data. This is a graph of annual overseas visits by the Chinese. Now, in 2000, the Chinese made around 10 million trips. In 2018, that was close to 150 million trips. Who would have ever thought that China's number one export would actually be tourists, would actually be Chinese people? It's incredible, actually. This, this growth represents a 1,300% increase in the span of 18 years. China, Chinese are now the number one tourists in the world. And it's amazing because look at the cash that they're spending. Okay? They're almost double the amount of what America, the second biggest tourist, are spending. They have the spending power. Their quality of life is getting better. Okay? They're traveling the world. And the amazing thing is, is when those 150 million people travel abroad to experience all these things, they go back to China. Because the reality is, is that in China, the quality of life now is just as good as anywhere else in the world. Chinese people love living in China. I mean, this is where we go back to the one-party state. You have to look at it in this perspective, is that over the last 30 years, China's one-party state has produced 80% of the world's poverty alleviation. 80% of the world's poverty alleviation has come directly from China. To put this in perspective, if you take out China's contribution from the worldwide poverty alleviation over these past 30 years, the result would be a negative figure. More people would have gotten into poverty than gotten out if it wasn't for China's efforts. And again, over the last 30 years, 800 million people have now gone from the lower to the middle class. That's an incredible number. And this shows why so many people in China respect the government and are optimistic about the future. Harvard University did a landmark study from 2003 to 2016. It studied all aspects of Chinese life, and it found that over 90% of Chinese look at their government in a favorable way. They support the one-party state in China because they can see the tangible results of their country. I would venture to say that the United States or even many other Western countries would be nowhere close to that 90%. Nowhere close. But now let's go to the next myth that I often hear is that there's no safety in China. And probably one of the graphs that scares a lot of people is this. This is looking at the top cities in the world that has the most CCTV cameras. CCTV cameras. And you can see on this list, it's dominated by Chinese cities. There's no doubt about it. There are CCT cameras all over China. In fact, the only city on this list that is not Chinese is London, that also has a lot of these closed-circuit television cameras that are monitoring everything that happens. Now, in China, you're never going to see a police officer pulling somebody over to give a ticket. That's all done automatically by cameras. Okay? The reason that people actually like this is the fact that all of these additional cameras provide an incredible amount of safety in the city. You see, even petty crimes like pickpocketing have almost now been eliminated because of the amount of cameras everywhere. Even pickpocketers, as soon as they pickpocket that, somebody can call up the police and say, I was just pickpocketed here. They can tap into the camera. They can use facial recognition and immediately find the criminal. Now, in Western countries, we're thinking, whoa, 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 that's way much, that's an invasion of my privacy. And yeah, it is. I mean, you are living you know, connected. The government is watching you. But for Chinese nationals, they say, well, it ensures my safety. I'm actually happy to give up some personal freedom knowing that I live in a country that we don't have these massive problems. For example, a lot of Americans say, Cyrus, 
We have the Second Amendment. We have the right to bear arms. And a lot of people think that that is what equals safety. Now, this is a picture from the Michigan courthouse earlier this year when protesters in America rushed the courthouse to say, we don't agree with these COVID lockdowns. We want our freedom. Now, it's very important. When you show this to Chinese people, <laughs> Chinese people are not looking at that and saying, that's not, they're saying, that's not safety. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm very happy to live in a society where we don't have guns because we don't need them. I lived in China for 10 years. It's one of the safest countries in the world. Absolutely. I mean, I come from Florida, again, where we were rocked by one of the most tragic school shootings in history. We have mass shootings every single day in America. Tremendous problem. China doesn't have that. It is incredibly safe. And Chinese people are willing to give up a little bit of that personal freedom to ensure that safety. That's not a sacrifice. But again, this is why it's important to travel and to understand that freedom and these values mean different things to different people. Having a gun is a very important thing for an American. And I get it. I understand American culture. But for Chinese, it's just not the same. So if you look at it from an American perspective, you're not going to be able to understand that. Now, the third myth I want to tackle is China is the biggest threat to democracy. And this is a touchy subject. I get it. And one, of the, and one of the videos that I made on my YouTube channel that's been my best video to date is this one, the truth about Michael Pompeo in China. And in this one, I open the video by saying this statement. Every time Michael Pompeo opens his mouth, the Chinese people love their country more. That quote really signifies what a lot of youth in China are feeling because the problem is, is that Michael Pompeo is continuously saying false statements about China. He's wanting the American public and Western countries around the world to recognize that China is this huge threat, when the reality is, is that they're not. You know, China is not the greatest threat to democracy in America, like Michael Pompeo wants you to believe. The reality is, is that China really doesn't care if anybody in the world has a democracy. The only country that they care about is China itself. So when people say China is the biggest threat to democracy in America, I say no. China has no influence in America. But China is the biggest threat to democracy in China. And the reason for that is simple. They have proven to the world that they have a unique system that works for them and has also been proven successful. But in order to really understand this, you must go back and learn about Chinese history. I'm going to take you back 122 years. This is a cartoon. This is a French cartoon that was published. And on this, you can see the respective leaders of England, Russia, Germany, France, and Japan, all looking down at this pie called China, all with their knives out looking at how can we divide this country? How can we conquer this country? What peace am I going to get from my country? Meanwhile, the, China, the Chinese man in the backdrop can do nothing about it. Western countries have been trying to influence and trying to gain access to China for centuries. But this is one of the amazing things about China. When you talk to Chinese people, they're very proud and will immediately say, we have 5,000 years of history. They're very proud of that. They're, one of the, they're the oldest civilization in the world. They're very proud of that history. And they're very proud that throughout their history, they've had to really endure a lot, a lot of humiliation, a lot of foreign interference. Go look up the Boxers' Rebellion when they had all of these different countries going into the capital city, trying to overthrow the government, trying to take over China. This is why Chinese people have become more nationalistic, and they do not want foreign countries to come in. This is why when Michael Pompeo says, we need to bring democracy to China, Chinese people say, you don't understand us. You don't understand our culture. Who are you to say, who are you to come into our country to tell us what we need? I've even had people tell me, Cyrus, you will never know what Chinese people want unless you give them the right to vote. So here's what we do. We go into China and we establish democracy. We then have a national vote. And what we can say is, why don't you vote on whether you should keep democracy or go back to your communist way? If you do that, then we'll truly know what they want. It's interesting because the problem is, is these people don't go talk to Chinese people. If you're on the ground in China, you talk to the vast majority of people. Again, the Harvard study from 2003 to 2016, 90% of the people in China support the government. They support what they're doing. This is not a Chinese study. This is Harvard University that had put out this study. Okay? If you talk to the people, you will realize that the Chinese people, they don't value these things. They have a unique system. 
And they are going to be very resistant to foreign interference. And that is what's causing a tremendous amount of conflict between China and the United States right now. Now, the next myth that I'm going to tackle is China is trying to take over the world. And I think when many people talk about this point, they refer to this, the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, this is a graph showing China with all of the different countries built on the Belt and Road Initiative. And what this Belt and Road Initiative is, is it is a series of investments made by China to start building infrastructure and increase trade amongst a huge amount of countries around the world. This is the new Silk Road. And what China is doing is they're going to continents like Africa. They're going throughout Southeast Asia. They're building new airports, new roads, new bridges, new ports, new everything to be able to help these countries improve their economics in order to help the local communities get out of poverty. Now, of course, this is going to, bet China, is going to benefit China in the long run. Like any investor, if you're going to invest in something, you want to return on that investment. But the reality is, as you look at the difference of China compared to Western countries, China is not doing this through military force. They're coming in and they're building this infrastructure. They're going to help out local economies. Okay? They give you know, 25, 30, 40-year loans. Even when COVID-19 happened you know, and debt payments became due, they said, we don't have to worry about it right now. We're going in a pandemic. You don't have to worry about those debt payments right now. Let's focus on getting back to the world. You look at the amount of aid that Jack Ma, Alibaba, and China's government has been sending across the world, whether it's personal protection equipment, you know, whatever supplies they need. They've done an amazing job in helping the world out. Now, I think when you look at how China is developing infrastructure, it potentially could change so many of these different countries. Again, you look at the continent of Africa. There's not another country in the world that is doing as much benefit to Africa as the country of China. Now let's take a look at a case study on what potentially this infrastructure development could actually bring. I'm going to take you back to a small little fishing village. This is the fishing village of Shenzhen. This is Shenzhen in the 1970s, when it was a city, not even a city, it was a village of 20,000 people. And this little fishing village in 1979 was named a special economic zone by the Chinese government. It was going to receive this special status to receive extra infrastructure development and to potentially be, it's going to be the future city of China, this little fishing village. Well, now let's take a look at what Shenzhen looks like now. 40 years later, this city of 20,000 people is now a city of 13 million. For the last 40 years, Shenzhen has been the fastest growing city on the planet. This is now the Silicon Valley of China. And its companies are rivaling that of America's Silicon Valley. When you look at how China is developing, when you look at, for instance, the term in investing of a unicorn, a unicorn is a privately held company worth at least a one billion US dollars. The city with the most unicorns in the world is Beijing right now. China is developing new companies. They're moving forward. They're building infrastructure. They're creating jobs. They're improving the lives of the people but China is a very important market, I believe, for the entire world as well. And I'm going to tell you exactly why. And to do this, I'm going to take you back 15 years ago to 2005, when I was very similar to what's going on in this room. I was in an auditorium at my university. And what was amazing was is we had an executive from this company come and give us a speech. Starbucks, the great American coffee house. Now, in 2005... I was a junior at, at university, and we had an alumni of, our, of, my home, of my school, Florida State University, come back to the business school, and she gave an amazing speech. And what she said is she said, the future of Starbucks is so great, and the future for this is because we are going to be focusing on international expansion. The speech was so amazing that that afternoon I went home, and I decided to buy my very first stocks. I bought 20 shares of Starbucks stock that afternoon because I was so inspired by her speech, and I said, I see the vision. I see the vision that Starbucks wants to create. I want to be a part of that vision. Now, I still own those Starbucks shares to this day, 15, days, 15 years later. And this has been an incredible investment, not because Starbucks is dominating you know, coffee in America. It certainly has an amazing market share in America, and it's doing very well. But again, 
The reason why for me as an American investor, why investing in this American company has become so important and it is such a good investment for me is because of its international expansion, most specifically in China, where it is its second largest market. This is why a few years ago when Starbucks decided to open the world's largest Starbucks, they did it in Shanghai. This is a picture of that Starbucks on the second floor. It's an amazing experience. This is walking down the stairs in that Starbucks, and then here is actually a coffee museum that they built inside this. Going to this Starbucks is actually an experience. You can go there for a couple hours, learn all about coffee, drink some drinks, just have the experience of going to the world's largest Starbucks. At, at one point, Starbucks was expanding so fast in China that they were opening a new store every 15 hours. 15 hours, a new Starbucks was opening up in China. They have completely capitalized on the market. Starbucks remains a tremendously popular coffee chain in China today. And again, Starbucks' continued growth is because of its international play. Let's look at another company, a company we all know, of course, and that's Apple. Now, Apple is one of the most valuable companies in the world, valued at over $2 trillion US dollars market cap. Now, Apple has been made such a valuable company specifically because of its relationship with China. You see, on one end, Apple does this, is they manufacture all of their products within China. And this is incredible because we know that this iPhone cost $1,000 in the store, but we know that they make it for pennies on the dollar in China. They save a substantial amount of cost by manufacturing in China. Then what they do is they ship it back to California where they then assemble it and then sell it to the domestic market. But the interesting thing about Apple's relationship with China is not so much just the manufacturing, because surely you could find other countries in the world to manufacture. What makes this such a lucrative venture for, for Apple is the fact that they get to then go ahead and turn around and take these manufactured iPhones and ship them from California back into China. And because China's domestic economy is growing and there's a huge need for these consumer products, and people have the discretionary income to buy things like these $1,000 phones, Apple's market share boomed also in China. So it's a two-way street. It's a double win for Apple. They get the great manufacturing at a great price, plus they get to establish their presence in China. And they also get to sell an amazing amount of products in China. Every time, every time the iPhone launches in China, it is a huge event. Now we look at other companies. This is the Gigafactory from Tesla that's been just opened in Shanghai. There's a reason why Elon Musk, one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time, who's the founder of Tesla, decided to go to Shanghai to open this because he wanted his factory in China. He likes dealing with the Communist Party of China because he knows that one party state is gonna make fast decisions. He likes selling his cars in China because he knows there is a growing consumer base for products exactly like his super sporty, amazing electric car of Tesla. This is why a company like Disney decided to open the world's largest Disneyland in Shanghai. Now, Disney already had a presence. Disney was already in Hong Kong. They've had that for many years, but they still wanted to have another location in Shanghai because the market's there. Disney profits tremendously from a relationship with China. Now, interesting enough, earlier this year in April, many people actually thought that because of COVID-19 and because of the trade war between the United States and China, there was an article that came out that said up to a thousand American factories were going to relocate from China. Everybody's leaving China and they're gonna take all these factories out. And that, of course, is what Donald Trump and the American administration has been moving towards. They want to see American factories leave China, come back to America, go somewhere else, don't support China. It's actually a a complete 180 what China is trying to do. Again, going back to that map, China is doing the Belt and Road Initiative, trying to build bridges, trying to do trade with countries around the world to help everybody. However, America is actually doing the opposite. They're saying, no, Let's cut off these bridges. Let's just manufacture in America. Make America great again. Only in America. Which strategy is going to work out for the long term? I personally think that working with more countries around the world 
is beneficial to a local economy. Now, interesting enough, again, when many people said there's going to be up to 1,000 factories leaving China and where they're going to go, well, many people thought they were going to go to India. And it makes sense, right? American factories, why don't we go to another democratic country? India. India has democracy. It would make sense. Let's start building factories in India. But there's actually a really interesting thing what happened when you start looking at why these factories did not end up going to India. The first reason is, is when you look at opening a new company in India, the registration process takes about 18 days to do in India. In China, it's nine. Now, that's not really a huge difference. Nine days, not a big deal. But when you're talking about relocating a factory, you need to get land, you need to get water, you need to get electricity, and you need to get a construction permit. Although India is a democratic country, there's a tremendous amount of red tape involved in dealing through that government. There's a lot of political turmoil that happens in India. Even though there's democracy, when governments change, sometimes the transition in power is not a smooth transition. There's a lot of uncertainty, political uncertainty, economic uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty in India. Again, we're going back to that one-party state, that stability that's been very important. Now, the interesting thing here is when you start looking at this logistics of getting all the permits, you know, you're now looking at six to 12 months in order to just to get the permits to start doing the work you wanted to do in India. That represents a tremendous opportunity cost. Now, in addition to that, we have to look at other factors. Number one is currency. Okay, for American companies going into a foreign, company, for a foreign country, you need to have a stable currency. Well, the Indian rupee is a much more volatile currency than the Chinese yuan. And that plays a very big role because if a currency is extremely volatile, that could completely wipe out your profit margin. In addition to that, we know that India does not have the infrastructure that China does. So we're talking about these roads, these bridges, these airports, these ports, all of these things that China is building around the world, most specifically building within China. China is set up logistically to handle the infrastructure. India is not. So if you're manufacturing there, you're going to have to have added expenses to, to perform all of these logistical operations. But the real reason, the big reason, is going back to that marketplace, that marketplace of China. That's the real lucrative thing. That's why these American companies want a presence in China. And in, in India right now, there's 800 million people that are living in the lower class that do not have the money to be purchasing these products. And for an American company, you're wanting to establish yourself in the domestic market. Okay, on the flip side, China has 800 million people, again, in the middle class. The average Chinese person has five times the buying power of the average Indian. And this is why what we saw happen with General Motors. General Motors initially went to India, and they established a car factory there. Because they realized that in India, there was a tremendous opportunity to build up market share. And that potentially there was going to be a tremendous amount of Indians buying General Motor cars. But in 2017, GM decided to pull out of India. Even with a long-term look, they realized that the investment simply was not making sense for them. They pulled out because simply there wasn't enough local demand. They weren't getting that two-way relationship that we talked about earlier of manufacturing for a better price and selling back to that domestic economy. And this is why China is still such an important place to manufacture, still an important place for American companies to build their presence. Now, I've had somebody ask me before, they said, Cyrus, I don't want to invest in China. I just want to invest in American companies. So here you go. Here's the Dow 30, 30 amazing American companies. Everybody from Nike, Apple, McDonald's, okay? Disney, Dow Chemical, Microsoft, all of these great companies. Now let's go through the list and just imagine how many of these companies are connected to China in some sort. Well, we just talked about Apple. Okay? McDonald's has over 4,000 outlets there. Nike, huge presence in China. The drug companies, they do a lot of manufacturing there. Visa, of course. I mean, all of these, we can go one by one. Boeing, I mean, come on, China buys a tremendous amount of jet engines. If you look at all of these companies, you're going to be able to find that all of them are connected to China. All of them are increasing their bottom lines and their revenue and are driving shareholder value because of a relationship with China. So the reality is, is that if you don't want to invest in China or you want nothing to do with it, 
then please don't invest in any of these companies. This is what my main point is, is that our worlds are so connected. The other thing about it is, is when you say, I want to bring back all of the jobs from, all of the manufacturing jobs from China, you have to think about it. American companies, and not just American, but companies around the world, they have literally spent tens of billions of dollars, if not hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, investing into these companies, into these factories, building the logistics. This is not something that you can just pull out of China very easily. Our economies are so interconnected that the easiest way forward is we have to learn that there's going to be differences, but we must work together. Now, the other reason why the world needs China is because China is developing the technology that has the potential to change the world as we know it. And there's no greater example than 5G. Now, here in Canada, in North America, we're still waiting for 5G. But in China, 5G is everywhere. Okay, Huawei, the Chinese company, has developed 5G. And they are so far ahead of anybody else in the world that it actually started to scare America. Because they realized, wow, we are not even close to competing with Huawei on this scale. But the reality is, is that this 5G technology is so important because it powers so many different things. When you have 5G, you can have amazing things happen in your city. It can save costs and improve the lives of your city and of your life, of your people. For example, going back to Shenzhen, that tiny little fishing village that's now transformed into China's special economic zone, this is a fleet of their electronic buses. 16,000 buses in their fleet, every single one of them electric. They're now experimenting with driverless bus systems, all powered by the 5G technology. Shenzhen just opened a metro line not long ago that's powered by 5G. Okay, you have to have this 5G technology to bring you to the front. So again, in China we have a saying, if you want to see China's past, you go to Beijing. If you want to see the present of China, you go to Shanghai. But if you want to see the future, you go to that fishing village that's now China's third largest city. You go to Shenzhen. That's the future of China. But I say it's not the future of China. It's the future of our world. That's the future city. In China today, it's almost a cashless society. Okay? People are using their cell phones and mobile payments like Alipay, WeChat Pay, to completely transform their lives. 90% okay? of transactions done in China today are done via mobile payments. I was back in China last year on a business trip, and I actually had some renminbi that I had to use. I wanted to get rid of it. And it was so difficult to use that because everywhere you go, everyone is so used to using your mobile phone. Cash was an inconvenience, but this shows the future. China recently launched its first digital currency. And what they did is they experimented again in the city of Shenzhen. And they started giving out a few million dollars worth of this digital currency, and they did an event. They wanted to see how it, locals would spend it. And so what they did is they said, if you want to, register for this event. We're going to give you some digital currency, and then you can go to these vendors, and you can try it out. Again, the future of the world is being tested right now in Shenzhen. All of this future technology that is leaps and bounds ahead is all being developed in China. So this is why it's important for us to develop a relationship with China, because again, China is showing the way. They're experimenting with stuff that is so far you know, unimaginable that you know, we can't even imagine it here in the West. It's unbelievable what they're doing in China. This is a picture of a countryside in China, completely surrounded by solar grids. China is the largest producer of renewable energy in the world. And this is amazing because obviously China, with its population and the growing amount of infrastructure in cities, they need a tremendous amount of energy. It's very important for China to develop this renewable energy, one, because, again, they need it, but two, they need to start reducing their carbon footprint. Now, one of the interesting things that I saw over this past week was during the presidential election of Joe Biden. I don't know if you saw this, but this was a sign that was shown when he was announced as president-elect. Notice what it says there on the sides. The people have chosen science. Now, Donald Trump has continuously said that he does not believe in climate change. He does not believe in global warming. As a result, what he did is he pulled America out of the Paris Agreement. China has remained committed to being in the Paris Agreement. Okay? The Paris Agreement is this global effort to get, our, to get global warming under control, to bring us to carbon neutral. China has stayed committed to that. 
And what China has said is that by 2060, they will be carbon neutral. But Joe Biden came out and he said that America, under a Joe Biden presidency, will be carbon neutral by 2050. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the type of battle that I want to see China and America get into, the race to carbon neutrality. That would be incredible. And in fact, I think that if China and America could learn to work together, I think they could do it even faster, maybe even by 2040. Who knows? But the reality is, is that when you have the two greatest countries in the world, the two greatest superpowers, I should say, China and America working together, the entire world wins. And that's something that I often say on all of my YouTube videos and my messages when I give speeches like this, is that I'm a passionate American. I love my home country, but I want to see us develop a better relationship with China because I know that if we do, it's going to have a ripple down effect and benefit every single person in the world. Now we're coming up to the end of this speech and I want to just basically tell, say one major point. And that is the thing that not only has China developing all of these great technologies, but similar to that graph of sending these overseas visits, China is also sending a very precious resource abroad. And that is Chinese international students. Chinese international students is a tremendous resource. And again, it's why I'm here at the beautiful Thompson Rivers University. So big shout out to Carlos Kong and the entire organization here at the Chinese Student and Scholars Association. I wanna thank you very much for bringing me out here to Kamloops. It's my first time in this beautiful city, first time at this university, and I'm so honored to be speaking in front of all of you. And especially everybody on YouTube that has taken time out of your day to join us, wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining. But Chinese students, Chinese international students, are a tremendous resource. This is something that's been really, that's really undervalued and underlooked. <clears throat> Chinese students started going abroad, let's say in the 1970s and the 1980s. And you have to imagine, if you were a Chinese national that went abroad at that time, you had to have incredible grades in the, in the university to get out and to be able to actually qualify to attend a university abroad. The reality is, is that for decades, China was sending its brightest minds out of China to go study abroad. And the reality is, is that most of those students, when they went abroad, they never came back. They, if they went to America, they became American citizens. They settled down in America, okay? It's not until recently that now China has had all of this economic growth that now we've seen the opposite. We're now seeing that Chinese international students are going back to China. But again, many Chinese students around the world. Again, name a major city in the world right now that doesn't have a vibrant Chinese community. Chinese are everywhere. Again, it goes back to that point. The Chinese are cut off from the outside world. Well, how can they be? <laughs> There's Chinese people everywhere. You don't think they're talking back with their relatives back home? But the reality is, is that many Chinese students still do end up settling in beautiful countries like here in Canada. They're eventually going to become a Canadian national, settling down here you know, establishing their life. A great example of this that I can give is a man by the name of Eric Yuan. Now, Eric Yuan was born in Shandong province. He applied eight times for a visa to the United States, but was rejected all eight times because his English was too poor. Finally, on the ninth time, he became, he was successful. He finally got the visa and he came to California. Okay, he eventually went on to earn an MBA from Stanford University. And then he started his company in 2011 called Zoom Communications. All of us know Zoom now because of COVID-19. Eric is now, in 2007, Eric became a naturalized American citizen. His three children were born in America. They're all American citizens. His company, Zoom, American company, he's employing Americans. Everything is benefited because America welcomed this Chinese immigrant student into their country. Eric Yuan is worth $16 billion now because of Zoom Communications. He has a tremendous impact into America. He's paying a lot of tax. He's, paying, he's doing a lot, he's creating a lot of jobs. He's really helping the American economy. So it really breaks my heart when I see American senators saying, we need to come out and we need to ban Chinese international students. I had comments on my YouTube channel saying, you know what, we need to do better than that. Let's ban all international students. Why do we even need them here in America? To me, that is such a short-minded mindset. That's not how you get your, your country stronger. And that's one of the lessons that I learned here in Canada. Canada is built on diversity. It's literally written into the Constitution here in Canada. 
And this is why Canada is such a vibrant community of cultures from around the world. But again, we need to learn about these other cultures. We need to bring them in. Okay, we need to learn to work together. And I'm going to close it with this. I'm going to take you to Beijing, to the most important building in all of China's history. This is the Forbidden City. Many of you know it. It has the picture, the, chair, the picture of Chairman Mao, front and center. And I want to take you in and examine the words that are written on the outside of this building, most specifically the words written on the right side. Long live the unity of the people of the world. This is the message that China is sending to the world. Again, this is the message that the Chinese government is putting on the outside of its most important cultural building. Long live the unity of the people of the world. China is willing to work with countries around the world. But it's very really important. What we need to do is we have to realize that China is not this third world country that is now developing. China has to be given the same amount of respect as other Western countries. And this is something very difficult for you know, a country like my own, America. For the, for in a few years, China will overpass America to become the number one superpower, the number one economic force. And this is very difficult for Western countries to really conceive and really to you know, comprehend. Okay? For the last 200 years, we've always had a Western country be the number one in the world. And now it's China's turn. This century is now an Asian century. The future is in Asia. I don't think this is a bad thing. But I think what we need to do is we really need to recognize the fact that there are going to be differences. We need to, we need to accept that fact, but we need to build on our similarities. And I'll end it with this again, this comment. When the United States and Canada, the UK, Western countries, when we can learn to work with China, it's going to benefit everybody in the entire world. Thank you.